will serve as our moderator today. Thank you, Mark. All right, thank you all. And I am very pleased to be moderating this final event at the Water Pavilion on this last scheduled day of COP26. Uh, Dr. Claudia Sadoff did an excellent job framing our conversation today, and it is now my privilege to introduce our panelists. Maria Amakali is the Director of Water Resources Management in the Ministry of Agriculture, Water, and Land Reform of Namibia. Welcome. Maura Berry is the Global Water Coordinator for the U.S. Agency for International Development. Welcome. Brom Reams is the WASH Advisor for Action Contre la Faim, Action Against Hunger. Welcome. And Dr. Azim Shah is the Senior Regional Researcher, Governance of Water Institutions at the International Water Management Institute. Uh, welcome to everyone. And I have a series of questions for our panelists, after which I will open it up to the audience. If you are following this conversation virtually, you can pose your question in the chat function on YouTube. And we have folks that are monitoring that and will, they will be sending me your questions uh, towards the end of this moderated session. Uh, so with that, let's jump right into things. And I'd like to kick off with a quick lightning round in which each of you state which water and climate security issues were top of your mind before COP26 started? And Maria, I will start with you, Maria Macaulay. Um, thank you very much, Mark. And let me also thank the, the organizers of the Water Pavilion and the organizers of, the, of this session for inviting me. Um, I'm quite uh, pleasantly surprised that the water is given uh, this much attention at the COP. Uh, the main impacts of climate change uh, manifest itself in, in, in floods and drought. And meeting the meeting these water-related disasters is a challenge, and it requires investment in the adaptation and risk uh, disaster management. And this is, requires a lot of investment. Again, the early warning systems are very important and must be developed and strengthened. And this is especially true in the, in the case of transboundary cooperation. So the key issues I thought of, how do we strengthen our early warning capacity and how do we fund um, water and climate uh, security issues? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Maura Berry, to you, which water and climate security issues were top of your mind as you entered COP26, virtually or in person? Thank you, Mark, for that question. And let me just first of all thank the International Water Management Institute and the French Water Partnership for, for our longstanding cooperation. You know, top of mind for me before COP26 started was really that stark truth that the climate crisis is a water crisis. And what we've been hearing last week and all of this week is the time for action is now. You know, the world is facing daunting challenges managing water resources and ensuring that people, that the environment and food systems have the quantity and the quality of water that they need. And so I want to share real quick how USAID is accelerating its ability to act through a number of channels and recent steps. Recently, the U.S. Feed the Future coordinator and our USAID administrator, Samantha Power, released the revised U.S. Global Food Security Strategy on the heels of the U.N. Food Systems Summit. And the strategy reflects an intensified focus on climate that includes water resource management. Secondly, just prior to COP26, USA released its draft climate strategy for public comment, and that strategy underscores a number of key areas for addressing water issues, especially the need for finance. And then thirdly, the U.S. is in the process right now of updating its global water strategy, and we're hosting public consultations on that next week. So thanks for, um, but just top of mind, climate crisis is a water crisis. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. And Bram, over to you, Bram Reams. Uh, what, what was top of your mind entering Glasgow this year? Thank you, Mark, and also thanks to the organizers, uh, especially also French Water Partnership. Um, I had four issues on the top of my mind. The first one was um, how, this is a, I'm going to frame them as four questions. How can we balance uh, 
Adaptation and mitigation, and I realize these are the main, uh, one of the main topics of the, the COP26, but adding another element with response. So how can we balance those two together with response? The reason is that in some cases, I think adaptation, even mitigation, just isn't enough. Uh, it's not even uh, the most adequate uh, way of framing things in cases of severe floods severe droughts, severe natural disasters related to climate, you need response to be able to meet the immediate needs of uh, affected populations. The second one is, and it's linked to the first one, how can we think about the, the, the climate crisis in a, in a broader framework of the sustainability of wash services? And I think it has been mentioned several times uh, over the last few days. Um, sustainability of water services has been, uh, over the last few years, a big focus of the sector. And the climate crisis is adding another complex layer to that. So this is an issue. The third one is how can we uh, increase political will, including funding, uh, not just for adaptation, but also for response. Uh, as just a quick example, uh, humanitarian appeals have been funded for WASH. Uh, for about 54% in 2019, so there's still a big gap. And the fourth is a bit of a specific one. It's how can we draw more attention to groundwater specifically? Why? Groundwater is a black box. We like the data. Um, there's very little known about the status of groundwater. You can't see it from space, um, but it's absolutely key for climate resilient approaches. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, and Dr. Azim Shah, over to you. What was top of your mind as COP26 uh, kicked off this year? Thank you, Mark. And I'm extremely glad to be part of this uh, session. And uh, to be honest, I was uh, looking at whether water comes at the center stage or not. And uh, this notion of, you know, water security is basically extensively linked to the uh, climate security, and I'm really glad that you know uh, this effort to the water pavilion has brought this to the to the focus of uh, each and every individual who has participated. Um, the other issues, uh, to be honest, uh, I, I come from Pakistan, and uh, the region is is uh, prone to frequent floods and as well as droughts. Uh, so there has been a lot of uh, discussions that I've seen on these topics, and uh, particularly I represent EMI, and we have been very active in developing tools and technologies to tackle these issues like uh, floods and, and droughts. Um, uh, similarly, you know the. Uh, sustainable management of groundwater uh, that has been in my mind obviously that you know it's been discussed or not and the solar based uh, uh, groundwater management and you know sustainable groundwater management I would say uh, is, is one area where I've seen uh, there has been a lot of discussion so uh, in all I'm, I'm quite glad uh, you know the, the issues that I had in my mind have been uh, discussed extensively and there are certain issues obviously that need more attention. So uh, we will we'll probably discuss during the course of our discussion. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, that lead off question. And now Maria Amakali, I'm going to turn back to you. Given your deep policy experience in Southern Africa water security environments, especially in Namibia, do you think regional collective action on water resources management is more or less important than national decision making in achieving greater climate security for the people of the region. Uh, you might need to unmute. Yes, uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, the short answer would be yes. Uh, regional collective actions on water resources management is very important. It needs to be coordinated with the national policies and the decision-making processes. As we know, uh, Southern Africa, we value water as a catalyst for regional economic growth through our cooperations in water resources management and development. And this is um, seen in the SADC Treaty where it advocates peace and regional integration. At the same time, there are several policies and strategies which are developed and need to be domesticated when it comes to 
water resources management in each country. Um, when we talk about cooperation, SADC has about 15 river basins, which are shared among uh, all its uh, states, uh, except for the, base, uh, for the island uh, states, of course. And um, this, these are established as the uh, revised static protocol on shared water courses. And at the helm of all these uh, river basin organizations is the Integrated Water Resources Management Plan. They are developed at the basin level and they are implemented at the, at the national level, but coordinated by the Secretariat, and both for the River Basin Secretariat and the, the SADC uh, Secretariat, as you may. Um, Southern Africa uh, climate is very, uh, naturally, is very variable. And uh, it's, it has one of the driest countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, Namibia being one of them. As such, water security is, is, is very, is, is a key. And if you look at the climate predictions, it does not look very well for us. Uh, we are expecting more and more floods and we are experiencing more and more droughts. Uh, as we speak, we are coming out of the out of the five year or four year drought. Um, we hear uh, Cape Town. Everybody knows Cape Town was about to run out of water. So was Windhoek was about to run out of water. Until we have to come up with innovative uh, measures, we have to transfer water from. Uh, we have a interbasin transfer. We have to take water from other basin and bring it to the basin where it needs. We have to to use a lot of, uh, of groundwater because it seems groundwater is our savior, especially when in, in, in times of drought. And similarly, we have to reuse, uh, for, especially for window, what we call uh, we re reclaimed water. It's actually used for, for, for potable use. At the same time, we are developing our desalination capacity. Uh, we always say there's enough water in the sea and it's time that we developed. And we are also di discussing this, not only for, for countries which have a coast, but also for countries who don't have coast, like um, uh, Botswana, for example, so they can take some uh, desalinated water from, from Namibia uh, into, into Botswana, for example. Um, so if I can um, go into more details, um, mm -hmm. Namibia is, 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 is downstream of most of their neighbors. And when you're talking about cooperation, it is uh, it, it's a must. Um, we need to, to cooperate when it comes to sharing of the information. We are talking about uh, flood information, rainfall information, and also the way we use water in an integrated, uh, in, in, in an equitable manner. And of course, uh, somebody mentioned the, the use of uh, of, of groundwater. Mm -hmm. I think we are one of the, we have a, a river basin, two river basins in which uh, groundwater is, is, is the key. Uh, we have the Orange River where we have a key aquifer we shared with our neighbors. And of yeah. course, we have the, the Kuvelai Basin, which is relying mainly on, on occasional floods and more deeply on, uh, on, 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 on groundwater. Yeah. So if I can conclude, um, Climate change really does contribute negatively to the water security in the, in, the, in the regions. And we need to adapt new measures, new alternative way to, to share water instead of just getting, instead of relying on, on the normal surface water uh, issues, uh, increase our diesel, increase our reclamation. And of course, I, I have to repeat the issue of funding. Uh, yeah. We need to increase our funding cap capacity. For we will get into all of these, all of these <laughs> issues. Uh, you mentioned groundwater a few times, an issue that I know Brahm Reams has raised and is deeply concerned of. And I'd actually like to move this conversation from one side of Southern Africa to the other, to Mozambique. And uh, Brahm, in Mozambique, how is climate change compounding already existing vulnerabilities, and how is it linked to conflict and health crises, and how are humanitarian agencies like your own responding? Thank you, Mark. Um, so yeah, um, Mozambique is number one on the Climate Risk Index 2020, and it's number five of, of the on the Climate Risk Index 
worldwide over the last two decades. So it's one of the most uh, vulnerable countries to climate change, not just in Africa, but globally. And there's a reason for that. Uh, Mozambique has been affected by and is being affected by, by cyclones and tropical storms for a long, long time now. Now, in 2019 was the first time that the end of 2019 and beginning of 2020, two cyclones hit the country. Uh, one was named Ida and the other one was named Kenneth, and they both affected around 2 million people. Um, the IPCC report, by the way, there's no, there's no linkage in, in terms of the increase in the number of cyclones. Uh, linked to climate change, could be the contrary even, but cyclones are becoming more uh, intense. And so the, the damage is, uh, is a lot worse. 2020 saw another tropical storm. In early 2021, uh, another cyclone hit, this time Eloise, and caused another uh, enormous flood uh, damages and so on and so on. This was happening against the background of an armed conflict that started in 2017 and that intensified really in 2020. Today, there are around 800,000 internally displaced people in the north of Mozambique. So the, these cyclones, these natural disasters, um, they do lack, they do cause uh, problems in terms of lack of livelihoods, they destroy livelihoods, and they help to create the conditions that, for instance, non-state armed groups uh, are able to uh, recruit. Um, and, uh, and, and you see the linkages, and, and you also see an increase in, for instance, in cholera cases. So last this year, there were around 3,000 cases, 28,000 cases with uh, acute watery diarrhea. And then you have around today a third of all the health facilities in the north that are destroyed. Around 170,000 people that do no longer have access to their primary water source. Um, and so what's happening is you have internally displaced persons trying to access water sources uh, from host communities. This is creating more tensions um, and it's increasing things like waiting times around, around the source. So you have a climate crisis that is compounding and exacerbating uh, existing, you know, humanitarian uh, risk, conflict and disease. How are we responding? Do you want, do you still want me to answer? Yeah, well, I mean, just, just one brief uh, minute on how you are responding and then we can move on. Right. Um, so we're doing the basic stuff, water quality treatment, water point repairs, hygiene promotion, emergency latrines. But we're starting with gender assessments. This is absolutely key. You know, what's the, how is this affecting the women? Um, and then we're really trying to take the opportunity also to localize the humanitarian response, working with local organizations and local NGOs. And finally, we're also involved in uh, uh, the humanitarian coordination on the ground. Over to you. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, and Azim, from, uh, from Mozambique to Pakistan now. In Pakistan, how are water and climate extremes changing physical and socio-political landscapes? And what solutions have been and should be implemented to tackle these issues? Thank you, Mark. Uh... In Pakistan, uh, I'll start with um, Pakistan stands uh, between the first uh, to 10 most climate vulnerable countries. And uh, this has been the situation. And we have not been contributing more than 1% to the uh, global carbon emissions. Uh, so a country that is not contributing towards those emissions, but still being uh, one of the most climate vulnerable countries. And the evidence is that you know in the past decade or so, we saw the unprecedented flood of 2010 and followed by and in the largest river this is indus and in in 2011 12 and 14 we saw floods in the tributaries of the indus uh, so these these recurring floods have not been the pattern in the past uh, so it's happening because of these erratic uh, uh, monsoon rainfall pattern and um, and this happens i mean we saw uh, a couple of months back a very heavy rainfall event in the capital islamabad 
and the majority of the capital was flooded, uh, which was again unprecedented. So these rainfall patterns are changing. We have seen uh, droughts and prolonged droughts in the in the state or province of Balochistan. Uh, and because of those stores, the water level or the groundwater level is continuously declining and the people are primarily dependent on the groundwater for the agriculture, for their portable use. So these communities are continuously being affected. Similarly, there is a trend in the migration from, from those areas which are prone to these stores or uh, from uh, the floods. So people are moving towards the uh, more urbanized uh, centers, you know, causing another stress. And uh, we've seen, you know, the most polluted uh, regions of uh, uh, the world now are these uh, either Lahore or Delhi. So the uh, the air quality has, has decreased because of uh, so much of these uh, emissions that are happening around the around the landscape. Uh, and, you know, because of these uneven uh, flow patterns, our reservoirs are under, uh, you know, huge stress. The capacities are decreasing because of these uh, siltation uh, issues. Uh, we are also facing reduced hydropower uh, capacities. So the green energy which was used before is, is also under threat. Uh, similarly, you know, because of uh, the expansion of uh, uh, the population from urban to the peri-urban centers, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, tree cutting has been taken place and uh, that is resulting in, in soil erosion type issues. So the issues are huge uh, uh, and uh, I, I'm glad that, you know, uh, the current government, uh, the Prime Minister Imran Khan, uh, has been very active uh, as an advocate of this climate-induced uh, uh, catastrophes and uh, he started with a, with a campaign of uh, afforestation back in uh, 2013, when he had a government of uh, uh, Khyber Pakhtunpa province, and he called it a billion tree tsunami campaign. And that then has been now further extended to 10 billion tree tsunami campaign across the country. So there's been massive afforestation has been happening. And uh, the other initiative at the government level is basically biodiversity cons conservation, where they are trying to protect the uh, areas which are still not affected by the you know influx of uh, uh, population from the urban centers. So they are declaring those as national parks. Mm -hmm. So to just to pro protect the biodiversity over there. Uh, one of the other issues that we have seen is because of the uh, competition increasing between the provinces, we have seen, um, uh, you know, issues being popped up at the federal level between the provinces on water sharing. And uh, this is an area where we have been very active as uh, Amy. Uh, we have invested in, in the telemetry systems uh, just to make uh, the water sharing a system transparent so that the provinces may have uh, more trust uh, on this water sharing. And, uh, and I'm glad that, you know, the agencies have also participated in, in contributing to that. Okay, Great, stop here. Thank you. No, I, I appreciate the geographic diversity of our panelists uh, today. Uh, it seems, despite the geographic diversity, there's a lot of similarities in the challenges uh, everyone is facing. Uh, Maura, Barry, I'd like to turn it over to you now. Uh, what do you see as the main concerns for development and humanitarian agencies operating at that nexus of water and climate security that we've just been discussing? And, and how do you feel agencies need to respond. Thanks, Mark. I think, you know, that question on how development and humanitarian agencies work on the nexus of water and climate security, it's such an important question. You know, 80% of the places where USAID works are in acute crisis. They're recovering from disaster or experiencing smaller scale upheavals. And average humanitarian crisis now lasts more than nine years while the average duration of humanitarian displacement is 17 to 20 years. And in countries experiencing protracted conflicts, we know that children under five are more than 20 times more likely to die from diarrheal disease that's linked to unsafe water and sanitation than from violence in conflict. So water is really a fundamental piece of this puzzle and it's critical to blunt the worst impacts of climate change. Water insecurity due to climate change, we know that it may push an additional 132 million people into poverty. We also know that it induces migration and it ignites social conflict. 
And climate change will make providing water and sanitation services and solving water resource management challenges all the more difficult. Already nearly half the world lacks sufficient water once per month uh, in a year. And by 2050, water insecurity could cost some regions up to 6% of their gross domestic product. So USAID is, uh, what we're looking to do is elevate the humanitarian and peace development nexus as an intermediate result in the forthcoming USAID climate strategy that I mentioned earlier. Uh, water, the water sector is an obvious entry point for some of that collaboration. And also we're going to underscore and reinforce this in the agency's plan under the forthcoming revision of the US government global water strategy. I know I'm talking a lot of strategies, but they are important for policy and how we, we um, organize our work. Um, that the global water strategy revision is taking place next year. And also, which I mentioned, our global food security strategy also underscores, that was recently released, also underscores this nexus of humanitarian development um, assistance. So, I think we all recognize that siloed approaches to delivering humanitarian development and peace building solutions are not effective and they decrease the level of assistance USAID and its partners can provide. So USAID is looking to strengthen the coherence of policy and programming across humanitarian development and peace building actions to address humanitarian needs, including those of displaced populations, reduce future climate risk and tackle the systemic cause of climate vulnerability that are rooted in inequality. So we really welcome the partnerships um, with other development agencies and organizations in promoting and carrying out this type of um, systems approach to the work. So thank you, Mark, back over to you. Uh, thank you. I have a, another round of questions now. I'm gonna go back to Maria Amakali in Namibia. Uh, what do you think are some strategic examples for coordinating water policy between players at the regional, national, and international levels in a way that will be beneficial for both human and ecosystem health? And what can we learn from these? Um, yes, uh, thank you again, Mark, for the, for the good questions. Um, from our point of view, uh, there are several uh, strategies which are already there, and then we can we can um, grow on. As I mentioned earlier, we have the the SADC treaties, and it's very specific on what is it that the member state have to do when it comes to to cooperation. And at the same time, those are the strategies which are taken into the uh, national uh, strategies. So. For, 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 for better cooperation at, at the national and, and, and regional level, we have to look at what are the, what, what do we have in our IWRM plan, for example, and how do we make sure that the activities which are listed there are actually uh, are funded. I, I like to keep going back to the issue of, of a warning system or early warning systems. Um, as, as, we, as, 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 as time grows, if I may put it like that, or as time goes, the impacts of, of, of climate, especially on water related, is becoming more and more. But if you live downstream, you are relying on your neighbors to inform you whether um, the, the, the floods are coming or the drought not so much. Some countries are fully uh, better equipped and the others are not equipped. So it's important that we will develop these uh, these systems so that we want uh, each other uh, uh, properly. It also goes with uh, when the when the rivers are going low and the dams uh, are going low. Uh, it's good to warn each other. And uh, the other uh, issue I wanted to discuss it's about what where are the funding uh, opportunities uh, for especially for transboundary cooperation. Of course, the the, the, the national budget uh, it is there to to contribute to the joint activities. But you have those uh, general activities uh, which needs to be strengthened and can only be done at the at the joint level. Mm. Um, at, at uh, AMCAO, for example, uh, we are also looking at the uh, Africa Water Investment uh, Program, which, which can leverage some funding uh, for, 
water uh, uh, water security infrastructure um and it, it should be a, a, a reachable uh, or available for 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 everyone uh, at, at any level it can be implemented at the national and international level thank you so i'm oh, well do, last... do, do you have a, what, a concluding thought and we'll we'll move on yes one last one um for example th there are I wanted to, to discuss about other instruments. We have the static protocol on, on water courses, but we also have an opportunity to engage on other um, uh, convention, for example, like the, the UNEC convention for water. I'm, I'm glad uh, uh, the UNEC people are here. That is also an opportunity where what we don't have in our, in our protocol, we can um, learn from there and then there it's open up and it's open up for everyone and namibia and other side countries are also trying to accede to it just to fill that gap of, of, of what other thank strategies are there uh, thank you and maura barry over to you uh, the new usaid climate strategy 2022 2020 uh, to 2030 which you uh, earlier reference has been released to the public uh, for review and feedback. How do you foresee the strategy could help us tackle future water and climate security challenges? Thanks, Mark, for that question. Obviously, I'm, I'm enjoying talking about this strategy. So let me start off by saying that the Biden administration made significant commitments to increase U.S. government support for adaptation, including for climate resilient water and sanitation. President Biden committed to a six-fold increase in our international adaptation funding to developing countries by 2024. And we're working with Congress on the foreign assistance request, and we're seeking to provide $3 billion a year in adaptation finance by 2024. And then importantly, President Biden announced on the very first day of COP that we're activating what we're, maybe I can call it an all-hands-on-deck response to support partner countries' efforts to adapt to climate change. So across the U.S. government, all hands on deck. USAID will be playing a leading role in this response. It's called the President's Emergency Plan for Adaptation and Resilience, PREPARE. PREPARE will support developing countries and communities in vulnerable situations around the world in their efforts to adapt to and manage the impacts of climate change. And as part of PREPARE, USAID announced its commitment to mobilize at least $1 billion in public and private finance for climate resilient water and sanitation services by 2030. So through this commitment, USAID will partner with national and subnational governments, water and sanitation service providers, NGOs and development, financing institutions and financial institutions to catalyze innovation approaches to blended finances. Um, for example, we're, we're going to be working closely with our US International Development Finance Corporation colleagues so that we can develop credit guarantees that reduce investor risk. Also, we'll be helping partner countries to improve the enabling environment for private investment through regulatory reform and institutional strengthening. And this commitment ultimately is going to help mobilize urgently needed resources to protect hard-won gains on the WASH access and ensure that we accelerate our efforts to reach the water resources, drinking water, and sanitation targets that were set under the SDG 6. Um, and then finally, just to say that this really comes as an opportune time as we're re-examining our efforts on water overall. So just again to highlight that um, next year, the U.S. will deliver the next U.S. global water strategy, and in that will highlight the importance of mainstreaming climate and programs that aim to create a water secure world, including access to safe drinking water and sanitation. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And, and that leads nicely into my next question for Bram, Bram Reams. Uh, we touched on this earlier, but I'd love to have you elaborate a little bit more on how climate crisis is affecting the humanitarian response in Mozambique, as well as other countries. Uh, what can be done to meet people's needs there who are affected by this crisis? Thank you, Mark. And uh, allow me to uh, briefly go back to the, the USAID strategies, the climate strategy, as well as, as well as the water strategy and ACF had the opportunity and thanks USAID always for opening up, opening it up to provide feedback on it. 
And I just wanted to say that the, the climate strategy has the great merit of mentioning the humanitarian development nexus. It's one of the few strategies that does that. So how is the climate crisis affecting the humanitarian response? Well, indeed, the crises are becoming more protect, protracted. Um, they, they do take longer. They do become more complex. Um, and the, the, the complex question that was always there, which was, when do you phase out the humanitarian response and start thinking long term, start thinking resilience, um, has become even more difficult today. And the, 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 the reason is that um, it is, it's become very hard to, you know, to, to address the immediate needs. Um, um, but also to try and build in longer term approaches while you are responding. Uh, so you, there's a risk of having some sort of vicious cycle where you respond every time there's a new crisis that hits and you, you don't draw away, you don't pull out um, in your response. You keep on responding and this is not how it should be. Uh, another major point is access. Uh, I mean, take, for, for instance, the uh, severe floodings in Eastern Africa, South Sudan, for instance. I mean, accessing these areas that are flooded for months is, has become very hard to, to reach uh, the people most affected. Um, so there's, there's several ways um, to, to try and address this. The first, I think, is localization, working with, mentioned it before, work with local partners. These are the first responders on the ground. Uh, work with local authorities. They have um, the, the expertise. Sometimes um, we can support them having and acquiring that expertise um, and making sure that through this localized approach, these responses are uh, likely to be more accepted uh, by the population. Uh, as Maria mentioned, early warning systems. Yes, these are absolutely key and they need uh, to be backed up by more scientific evidence. Um, and in, this includes um, qualitative forecasting and modeling, and it needs to be uh, you know, linked to these early warning systems. Um, remote monitoring is another one. So um, there's a lot of technology, there's a lot of interesting and innovative approaches. And finally, a multi-sector response. Just with WASH, we're not going to get there. You need to have the WASH health, food security, etc. All together, holistic approach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, Bram. And over to Azim Shah. Uh, as a state so dependent on one river system shared with four other countries, what role can regional and collective action play, and can Pakistan play in achieving climate security? Azim, you might need to unmute. Do we have Azim? Uh, Azim, Azim would need to unmute if you can hear me. We might have lost this connection. If not, we can move on. Azim, are you there? Okay, let's move on. We have um, just a few minutes left before we will move to the audience for audience questions. Uh, I would like to pose the same question to each of you and have you each just give me a, a very brief one minute answer. And forgive me for asking a question about the next COP on the last day of this current COP, but here I go. Forgive me my sin. Uh, what are, oh, is Azim back? I'm sorry, I'm back, yeah. Sorry, okay, I Azim, had a yeah, net first so, so just, just one one minute, can you talk a little bit about the Indus River Valley system and um, how, what kind of collective action, uh, what role it can play in terms of um, regional collective action in Pakistan action, and can Pakistan play in achieving climate security through this uh, shared river system? Just briefly in, in, in a minute, if you can. Okay, apologies. I mean, I had a network glitch. So uh, the Indus River system uh, is, is normally uh, shared between uh, four countries. It's uh, originates from the China, Afghanistan, India, and Pakistan. The but major chunk of the Indus is between India and Pakistan. And we do have a bilateral treaty 
between both countries. So that treaty has stood the test of time, I would say. But the biggest issue is this treaty was drafted in 1960. And uh, at that time, climate change was not the talk of the town. So and there's no consideration to climate change related effects on the water sharing between the countries. Similarly, there's no talk of uh, environmental flows, for instance. Uh, uh, and these are the big issues now uh, we are facing. On the other hand, I mean, we have Afghanistan and, uh, and there is the biggest tributary that uh, contributes to the Indus is, is the Kabul River Basin. And we do not have any water sharing arrangement with them as well. Uh, so what we are trying to uh, uh, advocate here is, uh, you know, as per the experience of Indus Water Treaty, uh, we should now, you know, promote the discourse of sharing the benefits rather than dividing the resource. So how can we share the benefits of joint management of the rivers and joint water governance per se? And uh, some ideas, uh, particularly with regard to Afghanistan, is, uh, you know, in these early warning systems that uh, have been discussed uh, by the other colleagues. Similarly, there have been studies where Pakistan can invest in the hydropower generation on the on the water that flows from Pakistan to Afghanistan. And, uh, uh, you know, that would build the capacity of Afghanistan in terms of storing the water, but that water can be released and regulated and Pakistan can also benefit. Uh, so uh, these are, you know, the, the active uh, conversations which are happening and uh, we are trying to build the capacity around, around these uh, uh, particular interventions on, on, on both sides of the borders between Afghanistan and discussions with the India as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, so I do want to get to audience questions. So this last question I will post to you. Please just take uh, 10 seconds to answer it or 15 if you must. But uh, looking ahead to the next COP, what are the most critical water and climate security issues that we need to address? Uh, and Amara, I will start with you. Thanks, Mark. So listen, I'm so glad we're thinking already. We need to be, right? Let's close this one and start planning for next year. I would say that one of the most critical issues is the one that Brahm underscored, and that is ensuring local ownership of the solutions to mitigate and adapt to climate and water crisis. We have to be far more intentional in promoting equity, inclusion, and locally led development principles. So that's what I'd say. Let's focus on equity, inclusion, and locally led development. Thank you. Thank you. And Brahm, uh, over to you. In 10 seconds. <laughs> In 15 seconds. 15 seconds. This was the first water pavilion. We need the next one next year. I think we have um, talked a lot to our own sector. Um, hopefully the next water pavilion can broaden it up to other sectors, you know. Um, and secondly, we need internationally agreed objectives and like targets we need indicators and we need commitments and I, I would hope this would be uh be a major topic in the next call thanks thank you uh and maria to you uh yes uh from my side also continue having this uh water pavilion at the next cup uh let's integrate water and climate together and what I would like to also see is inclusion of uh, transboundary water cooperation or transboundary water issues into the NDAs. I am glad that the updated Namibia NDA has uh, included has included water, and I'm hoping that we move next to also include the issue of transboundary cooperation. Thank you. Uh, and Azim, uh, last question to you before we open it up to the audience. The floor is yours. So I think, I mean, uh, one of the most important thing is for the global south, uh, the transfer of technology and the indigenization of these water saving technologies that are uh, quite prevalent in the in the uh, uh, developed part of the world. Uh, so how can we help the countries in the global south uh, to uh, basically catch up? with these technology interventions and conserve water. I mean, we, we do have shortages of water, but there's a lot of mismanagement happening. And if we can address those um, areas where we are poorly managing our water, improving our governance, I guess that's the future. So that is something I, I, I think that should be the focus in the next talk. Uh, okay, well, thank you all for uh, m uh, answering my questions. We have now received several questions via the YouTube chat, so let me, uh, kick things off. Uh, and I think this first question is best posed to Maura and Maria. So here goes. 
What easy and low hanging, quote, low regret water solutions can we invest in now to reduce future fragility and disruption to non-water SDG targets? So what water focus interventions now, forgive the, the pun, will downstream uh, foot help and, and um, improve other non-water related SDGs? And Bram, I know you're talking a lot about um, breaking out of these kind of water silos as well. So, so maybe you can jump in. Uh, Mara, would you like to go first? Sure, thanks. Uh, so low hanging, <laughs> what low hanging fruits have we got there, right? Um, I'd say one, you know, of course, improving the management of water resources uh, that has the potential to serve as a catalyst, right? For positive change way beyond uh, water related goals. So improve water resource management processes, I think can increase the Efficacy of other development interventions, including helping people to raise, uh, help people lift out of poverty by fostering greater access to um, employment and empowering women, um, you know, really addressing root causes of, of migration and social dis uh, social disintegration, disintegration, sorry. Um, so in terms of low hang of fruits, I mean, one of the things that I talked about earlier, I think, is, is finance that we really need to really, really need to focus on that issue of finance. It's something I think we can take action on now, ensuring that access to public and private finances is available. Um, so that's how I would answer it. Well, I saw Bram uh, vigorously nod his head when you mentioned finance. Uh, so, Bram, what resonated with you on that? The wash sector has traditionally not been at the very best uh, you know at advocating for we, we we're not professional in, in, in this regard and um, we need to work on that and um, and so this is it's really a challenge we need to you know we need to this and the water provision is the first step there's a clearly increasing momentum we've all seen the the, the water from the cars coming up next year 2023 is coming up uh, the, the the UN decade for water so um, so there's there's increasing momentum, and we need to become better at talking about wash and why wash is so much needed. So indeed, funding is the low hanging fruit. And allow me to add one element um, in terms of other SDGs. I mean, as Action Against Hunger, uh, that obviously I advocate for the linkages between SDG six on water and SDG two on hunger. Water can contribute to reduced hunger and especially to malnutrition uh, around the world. Thanks. Uh, thanks. And and Maria, is there anything in, in Namibia, is there like a water solution in Namibia uh, that you see might have an outsized impact in achieving the other SDGs? Um, quickly from Namibia, um, supplying of water to remote uh, communal um, areas. What are the innovative way to actually get water to those people? Namibia is a, is a big, highly sparse uh, country. And uh, you find still people far away in the rural communities where they still don't have access to water. What are those uh, innovative uh, technologies uh, which can still be used uh, to make sure that everybody have access? Once you have access to water, then you have access to increase your livelihood. You can have food, uh, uh, food for your for yourself, food for your animals, um, and then of course the issue of, of hygiene uh, get covered. So what what can we? What are the, those key uh, technology uh, best available technology that we can still move into the into, into the remote uh, rural areas? who still need to have access to water. Thanks, and Azim, I'd love to pose that same question to you as well. I see you nodding your head. Is, you know, in, in the Pakistan context, is there any kind of perhaps low hanging fruit or specific water solution that you see as potentially having an outsized impact in achieving other SDGs or other social and development goals? 
Yeah, for instance, I mean, uh, we had a region called Fata, which is neighboring with Afghanistan. And, uh, and that has been now, uh, you know, uh, it's subsumed as, as part of the merged districts of the province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. And uh, since uh, uh, Mora is here, I mean, USAID has been also investing in this uh, uh, region for bring stability and also improving the livelihoods of the people over there. So this is a large region. And I think that, you know, uh, providing uh, water uh, to those communities for uh, agriculture, for instance, would be a high uh, contribution. Uh, there has been uh, investments in, in some dam constructions uh, from development agencies like USAID and uh, other. Uh, so uh, expanding agriculture, bringing people into the uh, net of uh, uh, you know earning some livelihood decent livelihood would, would greatly contribute and and once people get engaged in in a productive activity uh, we can get away with the issue of terrorism and all that sort of um, issues that we have seen in, in the past so uh, that is a big contribution i think we can make if we can develop those areas uh, particularly bordering afghanistan and pakistan uh, well, that unfortunately is all the time we will have for this, the final uh, event at the Water Pavilion at COP26. Thank you all for your time today. And now I am going to turn the virtual camera and microphone over to Ms. Marie-Laure Vercambre, uh, Director General of the French Water Partnership. Uh, thank you all. And Marie-Laure Vercambre, over to you. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I think we 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 should say that uh, one of the things that all of the panelists uh, coming from uh, Action Against Hunger, from USAID, from uh, the Hindus River Basin, the SADC, um, uh, really uh, want, uh, we're happy. We're very satisfied with the. Uh, the, the existence of a water pavilion this year, um, and that there are also positive notes to highlight, uh, and one of them is um, the new uh, U.S. strategy, the global strategy on water. Um, as the U.S. Um, AID representative mentioned, Mora, climate um, crisis is actually a water crisis, and uh, Bram from Action Against Hunger uh, reminded us that behind the words of adaptation and mitigation that we're all discussing at length uh, during the COP, uh, there are actually severe droughts and severe floods that actually um, trigger conflicts. Um, the panelists today were here to share um, positive um, examples and solutions that actually really are here to 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 show the way and to give uh, to give hope. Um, with USAID again, um, with a, a really amazing transboundary cooperation organization like SADC, uh, with the mobilization that was mentioned by um, uh, IWMI from Pakistan, and I may add. Um, uh, the mobilization of France also that has announced a lot of funding for uh, for adaptation. Action Against Hunger reminded us of the link um, uh, between, I mean, reminded us that there were, that humanitarian organizations were constantly responding to crisis uh, and that, you know, um, it would be a good signal when they would not have to respond and respond and respond again. And USAID actually said that Indeed, the link um, uh, between uh, development agencies and uh, humanitarian agencies is key and that water is a fundamental piece for that, that children are actually sadly more likely to die from diarrhea than from uh, conflicts. Um, a very good example of um, uh, cooperation, I mean, the, the importance of cooperation was mentioned, especially with uh, transboundary, with water courses and water basins that are, that are shared. Um, and SADC highlighted the need to that these organizations are funded and capacitated, um, while actually others might simply need to be uh, created because many basins do not have a uh, transboundary organization. So um, they also agreed on the importance of early warning. Um, and it's interesting to hear an organization like SADC echo and the Hindus Valley 
echo what Action Against Hunger is, is say, against Hunger is saying. Yes, early warning is extremely um, important, and also the the importance of work, working with uh, local actors were, was highlighted. So, um, lastly, I'd like to add that. Um, uh, water was discussed as water for drinking, for agriculture and essential needs in this session, and, and that it should be integrated into a more systemic, holistic, and multi-actor approach to territorial planning at the most relevant scales. Um, that soil degradation and water issues should not be dissociated in the same way that gender equality and climate resilience are intrinsically linked. Um, maybe a last technical uh, comment that we need to build a new generation of farmers, of teachers, and of community leaders. And this goes back to what all the panelists shared, um, is that we, uh, we need more inclusion uh, when working uh, wherever all of them are working. We need them, we need those, um, this new gen generation qualified in participatory, uh, transversal approaches to sustainable rural development and integrated resources management, capable of placing a firmer understanding of resilience building through effective water management at the heart of local thinking and action. Thank you. And Mark, I think your mic is on mute. <laughs> so I think that. Um, oh, I'm I think happy. we're done. I think that was it. Thank you all. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see you next cop. Yes. Bye. Thank you, you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye bye. Yeah.